So what I thought I would do, people have different ideas about what counts as a legal fiction, or you may have only a vague idea of what counts as a legal fiction. So I thought I would start just by saying a little bit about some particular examples. Sometimes people think that legal fictions are just sneaky things that lawyers do or that judges do. Um, sometimes people think that they're uh, made up in a particular way um, or that they're, they, they just involve some kind of legal slate of hand that's not ethically suspect, but that's just a shortcut. Um, so I thought it might help just to look at a few examples of various things that people call legal fictions before turning to sort of an historical account of how people have thought about legal fictions in the common law uh, with some discussion of the ethical significance of the, of the ways that people have framed it. So I might just say even before turning to the examples that the thrust of the argument is you can think of legal fictions, I think, in either of two ways. You can think that they, you can think that what it is that characterizes fictions turns out to characterize pretty much everything in the law uh, so that uh, they're just particularly noticeable in some way with respect to fictions, but once you, or with respect to the things that people call fictions, but once you focus on those aspects, you find that they're just everywhere in law, and in fact, there's no particular value in using the term fiction. You're just describing um, legal strategies of reasoning or explanation or argumentation. Uh, or you might think that there is indeed something distinctive that picks out fictions as against other modes of legal problem solving and legal reasoning. And what I'll suggest is that both of those views have been present from the outset, that people have talked about fictions in ways that suggest or indeed seem to acknowledge explicitly that that's just how the law works as a general matter. And people who've assumed or, or tried to show by way of example and argument that there's something specific about fictions that distinguishes them from other stuff that the judges say. Um, so uh, some examples. Uh, civil death, the doctrine that co a convicted felon is deprived of certain legal capacities, for example, the ability to bring a civil suit, to leave a will, to vote, uh, and for those particular purposes, the convicted felon is treated as if he or she were dead. So many people think that that's a legal fiction. Uh, I will say that today, to the extent that the doctrine exists at all, it's done largely by statute, not by common law. And some people think that if it's done by statute, it can't be a fiction because um, there's some a uh, huge difference between what legislatures do and what judges do. Not everybody shares that view either. Um, coverture, a doctrine that's no longer with us, the doctrine that the legal identity of a married woman is suspended as long as she's married, so this is Blackstone. By marriage, the husband and wife are one person in law. The very being or legal existence of the woman is suspended during the marriage or at least is incorporated and consolidated into that of the husband. This was not a doctrine that was new in the 18th century. Blackstone is merely reciting what was an accepted view of how coverture operated that had already been true for centuries by the time Blackstone wrote this in the 1760s. Attractive nuisance, a somewhat more modern doctrine that if property owners place a dangerous object on their land, pool, or machine, the child comes onto the property and is harmed, the owner will be deemed to have invited the child onto the land and therefore will be liable for the harm. As I'll, uh, <coughs> as I'll make clear later, Lon Fuller is one of the people who was sort of responsible for offering this as an example of a legal fiction. And again, I think you'd find if you tried to establish its currency in contemporary law that it's either been adopted by statute, um, rejected entirely, or adopted in the form of simply asserting that strict liability follows. And if you listen to the people who try to give definitions of fictions, all of those ought to be ways of depriving it of counting as a fiction at all, because if you just say that strict, li strict liability follows, then you don't need the fiction of the invitation. If you 
adopt it by statute, then again, as I've said, it's not a fiction. And if it's rejected, then it's not even good law. So although people often will give you attractive nuisance as sort of a modern example of a legal fiction, um, I think, again, according to most definitions that people would give you, it simply can't be anymore, even if it was, say, in 1930, when Fuller was writing. Uh, so some people think that um, various kinds of propositions about the status of persons are legal fictions. Corporate personhood, the fiction that the corporation would be treated as if it were a person, the reasonable person standard, um, a standard that we use in various areas of law to make people liable or not, just depending on whether they acted the way a reasonable person would have under the circumstances. It's not only used, by the way, to determine liability. It's much more commonly used simply to determine whether someone can bring a claim at all. So uh, you, uh, if you if you wait too long to bring a claim, uh, even though you were on notice that it was available to you to bring a claim, and a reasonable person would have been aware that they had a claim to bring as of a certain date, then you just can't bring it after, say, two years or three years. And it's far more common that the standard is used that way to ask, what, uh, what would a reasonable person have known at X time? How would they have evaluated the state of affairs at X time or under, under certain circumstances? And if this plaintiff failed to act the way a reasonable person would have, then they just can't bring a claim at all. Um, the one drop rule, um, a racist rule that no longer exists in the law, that um, if you had one drop of um, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, a certain ethnicity, then you counted as a member of that ethnicity rather than white. So it was always a way of keeping people from getting counted as white. So some people regard that as a legal fiction. Some people think that constructive doctrines, constructive discharge, and constructive eviction are legal fictions. Not everyone would agree that everything on the list is. I'm just sort of trying to offer different examples to give, to give a sense of the range. So here the thought is you're really discharged or you're really evicted if you get an eviction notice, but you're not really evicted if um, you just have no light and hot water, but you're only constructively evicted. Um, whereas some people would say, well, what's the difference? Uh, they both count as legal preconditions for having been evicted. So it's odd to speak of one as truly being evicted and the other as only artificially or constructively being evicted. I left out, but I should have included, deeming provisions. So it's common, especially in statutes, but um, often even in the common law, for um, to, to have policies that, that say things like, um, this underground river will be deemed to be a pipe, an overground pipe for purposes of the Environmental Protection Act. Uh, so there are all sorts of deeming going on. And some people think that all of those are fictions as well, because uh, the underground um, waterway isn't truly an overground pipe. It's just deemed to be that. So again, the law is um, making something up. Um, so I contrast all of those fictions, or potential fictions, with what I've listed finally here on the handout as fictions of pleading. Bordeaux is in London, a plea which the court accepts is true because it allows the court to take jurisdiction over a dispute that would otherwise have to be litigated in France. Um, this, so in, say, the 17th century, this is a common way of getting, uh, say, the king's bench to have jurisdiction over a claim. And the defendant couldn't come in and say, no, 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 look at the map. Don't you, don't you understand Bordeaux isn't in London, it's in France. It was um, a, a so-called non-traversable allegation, meaning that it wasn't available to the other party to challenge or deny it. And the same is true with respect to the other example I give. The defendant was previously in the custody of the sheriff of this court, um, just so that this court may now have jurisdiction over that party. So I contrast the last two against the others because whatever one might think about the truth or falsity of the first group, it's clear that the last two do purport to make a kind of truth claim. It's just a truth claim that it's not available to the other party to deny. And it's, it, it seems to me that they make a truth claim in a different register just because you might imagine that 
somebody would want to come in and deny it, and that perhaps even it's unfair to the other party to deprive them of the option of denying it, but uh, the, uh, the court simply accepted them as true and, um, and proceeded accordingly. So to the extent that one's worried about um, the ethics of fictions, it might seem more obvious, or at least more directly obvious, that a lie is going on in the last two examples. They seem more openly made up, more openly false than, than the others. Um, so it might be that they're, they're all pervaded by a certain kind of deceit or falsehood, but it at least seems more prominent in the last two instances. And so to that extent, one might think that there's something more clearly unethical about those sorts of fictions. All right, so, so with that background, um, let, me, let me just sort of go through the examples and say um, a little bit about um, how these are operating at the time. And I, I, sh I should also point out the last two fictions of pleading, which were necessary just in order to create jurisdiction, were available up until around the mid-19th century. The Common Law Procedure Acts of the 1850s reformed the writ system and the pleading system so completely that all of the fictions of pleading disappeared. So you would see this Bordeaux is in London, this person was in the sheriff, who was in the custody of the sheriff, um, up through the early 19th century, but not thereafter. They completely disappeared from the scene. Whereas the ones, uh, the ones in the first group, it's generally true that no one called them fictions at all until the 19th century. So many of these existed in the law, but if you were looking at some discussion of fictions, it's very rare that any of them would figure on the list um, because people didn't tend to call those fictions. All right, so, so full back then, one of the earliest efforts to talk about artificiality in fictions in the common law, in fact, one of the very earliest self-conscious discussions that I've been able to find, this book published in 1600 is actually a book written for law students to introduce them to modes of legal thought and reasoning. And you'll notice he doesn't actually use the word fiction in the paragraph that I've excerpted, but he does in the immediately following paragraph. And it's clear from the language that he is here talking about things being made up and being imagined. So he says that uh, what students need to learn if they're going to figure out how to engage in legal reasoning is to understand what he calls these intricate and hidden points. They need to gain the ability to compound things and to resolve them by imagination and imaginatively to build and destroy. And then further along he says, uh, contrary to nature is the work of intelligence reflecting upon itself. And he, he seems to assume that it's that work of intelligence reflecting upon itself, which is precisely what's going on when people are engaged in legal thought and in what Cook called the artificial logic of the law. And further on still, he says, so, uh, so, so some people find all of this very worrisome. This is what he calls a spiced and scrupulous conscience. They, they, um, they reject it, they see it as false in some way or made up, and he says, look, if you're gonna engage in legal reasoning, you've got to accept that that's just how it works. Surely the supposal, admittance, and intendment of the law is necessary. You've gotta be able to say, you've, you've gotta be able to stipulate that the law just assumes certain things to be true, um, or um, engages in certain shortcuts in order to get at the desirable answer. You couldn't do that, neither the science of the law, nor any other which consists in contemplation and abstraction of the essences of things from the confusion and mixture of circumstances can be of any worth or force. So on this view, these artificial operations, these imaginings, making things up, are essential to law, visible throughout law, and in fact, um, throughout any similar abstract science, he says. He, uh, and finally, uh, if, if you tried to take all of that away, he says, you take imagine, uh, imagination away from the law, you'd be left with pretty much nothing. You couldn't, you couldn't get anywhere. You couldn't engage in legal reasoning. So as I say, he, he goes on to talk about fictions in the very next paragraph. Um, 
and all, all I mean to do by extracting this is to show that we have someone at the very beginning who thinks of these sorts of procedures, the things that he says make for fictions as just essential to how legal reasoning works, how legal doctrines proceed. It's just everywhere in law. And he's, he doesn't even imagine here that he's arguing with people who think that fictions are a more limited category. His argument is with people who take issue with the laws engaging in this sort of imaginative enterprise at all. So on his view, if you just accept that, then it, what, once you've accepted that that's just what law needs to work, then fictions are just sort of a mundane instance of that in action in the law. So, so he's not making it his business to differentiate fictions from other things in law, but to insist on the fundamental importance of imagination as a crucial legal ability everywhere. Um, a few years later, Henry Finch, in a book first published in Latin in 1613, and then translated into English by himself in 1627, two years after he died. So he presumably translated into English before he died, but it was reprinted a few years afterward. Uh, Law or a Discourse Thereof. It's one of the first books in the common law to include a large, catalog, a large catalog of things that he calls fiction. So he begins with a definition which he might have and probably did acquire by reading some civilian commentators. So he says, fiction is, um, he says, a feigned construction, which we call a fiction in law, is when, in a similitudinary sort, the law construeth a thing otherwise than it is in truth. Construeth a thing otherwise than it is in truth. So he might have said, if he were more intent on following the language of the Samoan commentators, maketh the thing otherwise than it is in truth. So even the verb construe suggested he's open to the idea that it's not about asserting truths, but presenting things as true. Uh, right? There's, there's a crucial difference, one might think, because it, it's not so clear that things are being asserted as false if it's construed otherwise than it is in truth. So he gives as an example a promise to one's wife in consideration of a thing to be performed by the husband. The husband on his coming home agree and perform the consideration. He may plead this promise to be made to himself. Sir John Baker, having gone through the Finch text and gone through all of the, all the examples are just like this. So, so Baker says, well, look, this is just a deeming provision. It's actually, so one might call it a fiction if one likes, but it's important to see that all that's really going on here is a deeming um, rather than uh, asserting. One, one might even think that deeming is going on in the example of Bordeaux being in London, but, but it's even more transparently going on here where you just take uh, a legal obligation and map it from one person onto another person. So uh, we'll hold you liable um, just so long as the preconditions work out this way. And as I say, every single example in Finch is a demon provision. This is just what Baker has pointed out. Um, so it may be that Finch thinks that demon provisions are different from most other things in law, and that's what makes them fictions. Uh, he, he does seem to take the view that fictions are special things that aren't just prevalent in the law in the way that Fulbeck uh, does seem to think. Uh, and, and it's typically true, if you look at the commentators after Finch, that people tend to think, uh, by and large, the, the idea that fictions make up a special category is far more prevalent when people bother to talk about fiction. So, so the Fulbeck position is one that can be discerned throughout this whole stream of writing. But um, at least up until the mid-19th century, Finch's idea that fictions are something more particular, more specific, seems to be a, a more commonly held view, even if people have trouble stipulating with clarity what it is that makes them different. So as I say, in the mid-19th century, the fictions of pleading all vanished because the writ system that necessitated them disappears. And very conveniently, very shortly afterwards, Henry Stumner Main writes this extremely influential book in which he articulates 
a new and very influential theory of fiction, the one that has been quoted ever since. It was quite influential at the time, and uh, people continue to quote it today. And they'll often quote it and say, that's why corporate personhood is a fiction. That's why civil death is a fiction. So Maine says, look, when, when lawyers talk about fictions, uh, they seem to have something very particular in mind, a false or vermin on the part of a plaintiff. And he seems to think that the legal definition precisely has to do with these non-traversable allegations, like the fictions of pleading. Uh, he says, look, I'm, I use it in a different way. I employ the expression legal fiction to signify any assumption which conceals or affects to conceal the fact that rule of law has undergone alteration, its letter remaining unchanged, its operation being modified. The fact is that the law has been changed. The fiction is that it remains what it always was. And for Maine, the fictions which, are, which can only be done by a court are therefore importantly different from statutes or legal change by way of equity. Equity, he says, is different because it's open about the change. Statutes are different because it's a legislature which is the proper authority to make a legal change doing it. So on Maine's view, if it's done by statute, it can't be a fiction. If it's done by equity, it can't be a fiction. But every time a court changes the law, it's a fiction. Why? Because there's this underlying assertion even if it's not asserted expressly in that particular decision, there's this underlying myth, he says, that judges find law, they don't make it. And that, that myth is belied in every instance in which a court changes the law. Uh, so it's perhaps worth observing. For, so, so first one might say, so this is quite evidently an ethically oriented account of fictions because the lie is that the courts aren't changing the law when they are, and that's exactly what's wrong with it. Uh, so, so one might think that you could cure the lie by having the court say, uh, well, we've decided that we used to do it the wrong way, and now we're going to change it, and we're going to do it differently. But for Maine, that doesn't seem to be good enough because he's completely uninterested in the rhetoric that accompanies what the court does. He says it's only legitimate if it's done by equity um, or if it's done statutorily by a legislature. So, so it's no good for the court to be open about it, although I will say he does seem to assume the courts are practically never open about it in any case. Uh, that assumption, I think, was quite wrong. If he had just read a bunch of 19th century decisions by courts, he would have seen that um, this idea that judges find law, they don't make it, uh, is, um, is, was sometimes invoked by judges, but by no means always. Um, Judges were often happy to say, yeah, we used to do it differently. This is, doesn't seem to be the right way to do it. We're changing the way that we do it. So they often were quite open about it. And as I said, that would seem to cure the ethical worry, at least. It's also strange because um, the example that he gives in the very next paragraph is the example of adoption. And what is the fiction of adoption? The fiction is that a person adopted by a family or adopted into a tribe or a people who wasn't previously a member is treated as if that person always had been a member of the new family, tribe, people since birth. But he doesn't observe that um, that could only have been done um, not by a court, but either statutorily or um, through um, some other completely different social conventions, such as um, by um, a religious convention or something like that. So it's striking that the, the example that he gives was not only not a fiction in English law at the time, but it's hard to imagine an instance where, um, at least at the time that he was writing, um, it, it could have been done by a common law court as opposed to by a legislature. And I'm not aware of any instance where it had been done by a common law court, not a legislature. Finally, it's perhaps just worth observing about Maine's account that even though people quote it with gusto today and say that's why corporate personhood or civil death or coverture or whatever it is is a fiction, if you accept Maine's definition, uh, those are um, only a tiny fraction of the instances that ought to make up the category of fictions. 
because on his view, just every time a court changes the law at all, that's a fiction, which means it ought to be a huge category. And the examples that I've just given are only a very few, um, perhaps particularly notable instances, but they go nowhere near exhausting the category. And again, I'm not aware that anybody today actually holds the view that um, a fiction is happening just every time a court changes the law. So there's something very provocative about Maine's definition, but it's not one, I think, that anybody today accepts. Uh, there is, I should point out, one really crucial aspect of Maine's definition, which I think um, hasn't been very heavily emphasized in the writing on Maine, and that is that for him, what makes it a fiction isn't the content of the fiction. Bordeaux is in London, the corporation is a person, uh, the wife, the husband and wife are one. It's the effect of what the court does. The effect is that um, nothing is, 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 is to imply that nothing's changed, even though something has changed. And that, I think, is a, is a crucial contribution to thinking about legal fictions, even if you reject everything else in Maine's account. This idea that fictionhood consists in what the fiction achieves or produces rather than in what it asserts is, I think, a really, a really crucial um, contribution to the, um, to the literature, to, um, to the idea. Finally, then, the still most prevalent account, and again, one that's very frequently quoted, is that given by Lon Fuller. Um, the examples on the handout are from the first of three articles that he published in the University of Illinois Law Review in 1930 and 1931. All three of them were reprinted as a book by the Stanford University Press without change in, in 1967. So he gives a definition of a fiction, um, which I think would have been a great definition for the fictions of pleading, although he includes a footnote saying that that's most definitely not what he has in mind. Um, and then he encountered, the, 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 the second extract is um, his effort to deal with a problem that his definition might seem to create. So he says, uh, uh, fiction is a statement propounded with complete or partial consciousness of its falsity, or a false statement recognized as having utility. He emphatically distinguishes fictions from lies and mistakes, and one of the aims of the definition is to purge the idea of legal fiction from the taint of false, uh, I'm sorry, not, not, not from the taint of falsehood, but, but the taint of deceit. He says, look, um, because everyone knows that it's false, it's asserted with knowledge that it's false, it's not meant to deceive anyone, it shouldn't deceive anyone. So if what you think is wrong with fictions is that they involve some kind of subterfuge or deceit, you should reject that idea, he says, because Although there's falsity, there's no attempt to deceive. That's why they are not like lies. Um, so there's a lot that one might then say about the candidates for fictionhood with which I began, um, civil death, coverture, attractive nuisance, because one might say, right, well, there's no falsehood in any of them to begin with. Um, there's no point in talking about any potential for deceit or potential for being deceived, um, because to say that we'll treat the felon as if he were dead is merely a correct statement of how the law proceeds. And there's no, there's, there's no assertion that the felon is dead. It's just um, right, the law treats the felon in a certain way, and that way is as if he were dead for these purposes. Um, again, if you just look at what Gladstone says, one person in law, there's no, right, no one's being asked to believe that the physical being of the two or one that's nowhere asserted is merely a true statement about how things work in law. And you could do that, I think, with, um, with everything on, on the list with which I began. So Fuller anticipates that problem, and it's telling that he does anticipate it, uh, but his response, I think, creates even more serious problems for his definition. So he says, um, well, some, some of the horriest of our fictions are statements that have been made by the courts and that plainly refer not to facts but to legal relations. So one might say, yes, that's true about attractive nuisance, it's true about coverture, it's true about civil death, etc. Um, isn't, that, isn't that a problem for his definition? 
Uh, and he says, for, so he then moves immediately. No, he, he only gives one example, and that is the example of coverture. So he leaves you to infer that other hoary legal fictions not specified here can be dealt with in exactly the way that he's about to proceed with the example of coverture. The fiction that husband and wife are one is an outstanding example, but is this a fiction? It's a statement not of fact, but of the legal situation of the parties. Okay, so not a statement of fact, therefore doesn't seem to trigger his definition to begin with. It's further a statement made by a court possessed of the power to create and enforce rights. If a court actually treats them as if they were one, are they not legally one? But, he says, but, it's just at this point that the fictitious element becomes apparent. The courts did not in actuality treat them as one. The statement was misleading as a description of their legal situation. So one might say, um, perhaps the first and most obvious thing to say is, if he's right, I think he's actually completely wrong, but if he's right, then it's a lie, which means um, that it falls afoul to the very um, set of distinctions he began, he began with, right? If it's misleading as a statement of, the, of their legal situation, then it's got to be capable of misleading someone, namely people who believe that it's a true statement of the law, which converts it from, from a candidate for fictionhood into a lie. So I think that's, first of all, a problem. Every doctrine that a court asserts is a valid legal doctrine that it doesn't purport to abide by is a lie, unless everyone also knows that the court doesn't propose to abide by the doctrine. Uh, and I think that's a pretty difficult su supposition to swallow. Okay, so um, notice too, well, you wouldn't notice this, but um, he provides no support whatsoever for this proposition. Um, I'm unaware of any legal historian who shares his view that the courts weren't actually abiding by the doctrine of coverture. It's certainly true that there were exceptions to the doctrine, as there are to every doctrine. Uh, so this would then, I think, motivate the question, how many exceptions must there be in order to render a statement of doctrine um, a fiction or a lie or, or false in some way? So that's not a question that he deals with because he doesn't acknowledge or at least confront the possibility that the things that he's saying are um, not following the doctrine might just be also regularly followed exceptions. Uh, he, gives, he gives no other examples, um, nor does he give us any grounds for figuring out um, how much inconsistency it takes for the not following the doctrine to turn it into the kind of um, solution that he proposes here. So I actually think that he's correctly discerned that coverture is a problem for his definition, um, as would also be pretty much everything else um, on the list with which I began. Uh, and he then offers uh, a way around it, which is no good whatsoever. I think he's um, historically wrong to assert the courts didn't follow the doctrine. But even if it turned out that he were right, uh, we then have a whole series of other problems. Um, and I'll just point out one, namely that every time you call something a fiction, you first have to check and see whether the courts actually abided by the doctrine or not. And conversely, with respect to every doctrine that people don't normally call fictions, um, you'd you'd have to first ask yourself, well, well, before we assume that it's not a fiction, let's see if the courts are actually following it or not, because if they're not, it actually is a fiction, we just weren't aware of it. So it strikes me that if you take literally the solution that he proposes, it introduces a whole new set of problems. Many things that people didn't think were fictions are um, on grounds entirely different from the ones with which he began. And many things that um, people call fictions turn out not to be um, because courts actually are following them. So uh, I actually think the better approach is just to recognize that he's clued into a problem with the definition with which he began, namely that it's completely inapposite for things that are statements of law, statements of doctrine, statements of legal relations, uh, and then just um, completely ineptly um, attempts to um, uh, uh, defend it off. So, if one arrives at the view that uh, the main definition and the fuller definition aren't particularly helpful in picking out the things with which I began, then you're back to the question of what does characterize those and what can we say about the ethical significance of that group if there's some way of um, making them resemble each other, um, some ground on which we can call them fictions. 
so what i propose is that falsehood is not a useful way of detecting fictions from non-fictions in law that generally the things that people call fictions are instances in which they perceive that the law is engaged in some kind of subterfuge or state of hand uh, but more specifically what's going on is that people see the law making something up and calling attention to the fact that it's making that thing up uh, and because the making it up is in the eye of the beholder there's some disagreement about what belongs on the list i actually don't think it's lying in the eye of the beholder is a serious problem for the concept of fictions it turns out actually that there's by and large a lot of agreement that most of these things are fiction. Some people argue about whether deeming provisions are, or constructive provisions are. Um, some lawyers, some of them are things that only lawyers think are fictions. Some of them are things that only non-lawyers think are fictions. But by and large, all of them, I think, um, seem to jump out at a viewer as an instance in which the law is making something up. And part of the reason why they do that is that it seems to people as if the law is being um, inappropriately cavalier about its ability to make things up and that's where the ethical concern arises that here the law is busy deeming persons to belong in a certain category or deeming the persons don't get to qualify for membership in a certain category uh, brazenly um, ascribing identity or refusing to ascribe identity to people in ways that endow some people with rights and deprive other people of rights so there's very often an ethical concern that either motivates or accompanies the characterization of certain doctrines as fictions. And that's, for example, why some of them seem rather dry and uninteresting. So the constructive doctrines, I would guess that a lot of non-lawyers don't particularly care that much whether you think that those are fictions or not. Whereas um, a lot of people think that virtually all of the candidates for fictionhood that have to do with persons in one way or another, the reasonable person, the one drop rule coverture, that they're fictions precisely because there's something more obvious and open about the laws um, brazen and open and indifferent procedure by which it just asserts people to qualify or not to qualify for certain kinds of treatment. And that's exactly what seems offensive and that might seem offensive even in instances where the category isn't a particularly significant one there's still just something um, unpleasant especially if you think about the history of the laws doing it you might think that even now in um, somewhat more um, somewhat somewhat um, drier and more technical instances when the law is up to that it's still sort of associated with the history of the laws brazen and offensive ascription of personhood or um, denial of personhood to various categories. So um, so on, on my account, it's the openness or the perceived openness of the law's fabrication that makes it a fiction. And I think that everything that people call fictions can be explained that way, and that that's a more complete and a more satisfying way of explaining the fictions that remain now that the fictions of pleading have been abolished. Uh, so Fuller, I think, it, it, it's interesting that he offers this definition in the early 1930s at a time when the proposition that falsehood is the necessary premise uh, is no longer a useful premise. Um, so that would have been great if he were writing about the fictions of pleading. I think it applies very poorly to almost every example that he does give in his book. And it's somewhat a puzzle why he wasn't more alive to that problem. The best explanation I can give, it's entirely speculative, is that um, he had gotten very excited by reading a few extremely interesting civil law commentators, including Hans um, Weinger, who'd written a book called The Philosophy of As If that had been translated into English maybe 20 years prior. And so he sort of inherited a definition from the civil law thinkers that he then didn't sort of interrogate very intensively, uh, although um, he did think more seriously about some other aspects of the issue. Anyway, um, it seems to me um, invoking the definitions of either Maine or Fuller, um, it, that's simply no good for the fictions that remain, which is why I've been trying to give a different account. Thank you.